Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the seventh edition of the 2023 OSHA webinar series. Uh, we had slated the program here in July to be a mid-year review, um, a little update about the, uh, the big developments over at OSHA so far in the year and sort of a forecast for, for what to expect over the balance of the year. And remarkably, we, as we set out to to develop the agenda for this, we ended up landing on a top 10 OSHA developments in the first half of 2023, which is really extraordinary if you think about it. There have been years where we've done this, that it's been a top three or a top five developments, but for a small budget agency like OSHA, that there have been 10 pretty significant things uh, that have gone on just in a half a year uh, is, is pretty remarkable, but that is the, the lay of the land. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit about how and why that is the case. Uh, but there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, thankfully, uh, for those of you who are regular attendees for our programs, a lot of what we're going to cover today in just a couple of minutes uh, each are things that we've done a deeper dive into uh, during a standalone program earlier in the year. And I'd encourage you to go back and check those out if you hear about something new and different during this uh, presentation today. Uh, and then others that we'll cover in more detail uh, in upcoming programs over the, the balance of the year. So why don't we uh, we'll jump right in and do a super quick uh, introduction. I think everybody knows uh, me and has met uh, a couple of our presenters. Um, and I'll just say real quickly, I'm, I'm Eric Kahn. Uh, I'm not turning my camera on today. I'm on a little bit of a vacation, but you got to try really hard to keep me away from the OSHA webinar series. It's one of my favorite things that we do as a firm. Uh, so I'm glad to join you all for a little bit uh, during this. I'm one of the founding partners of the firm, and I chair the firm's National OSHA Workplace Safety Practice Group. Uh, I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues, um, uh, Dan Deacon and, and Darius Rahani Shukla, who have been with us for uh, a while now. Dan for for uh, most uh, almost all of his career. But I'm really, really especially excited today to introduce for the first time in our uh, OSHA webinar series our new partner, Rachel Kahn. Uh, Rachel has joined us uh, out in California to chair our California practice. Mm -hmm. She is an extraordinary talent, an extraordinary uh, OSHA attorney, uh, and has spent the last several years as the head of the OSHA practice at a, um, uh, an AMLAW elite law firm. And, uh, and we, we just could not be more excited to have Rachel on our team, and uh, and we dropped her into the cauldron of the uh, OSHA webinar series very quickly in her tenure, so you all could get a chance to meet her and hear as one of our updates today, an update about um, about Cal OSHA and what's going on out there on the West Coast. Uh, as I mentioned, Dan Deacon is joining us today. He's a partner in our OSHA and labor and employment practices uh, based out of Washington, D.C., and uh, Darius Rahani Shukla, an associate in our OSHA and labor and employment practice, also based here in Washington, D.C. with me. So our agenda is really that top 10 list, and I'm not going to go through the whole agenda right now, but these are the things that we're going to cover little by little today in hopefully as close to an hour as we possibly can. So I think we, we skip right over this list and just jump right into the first topic, and that is an OSHA enforcement surge. And this is one of the things that is not terribly unusual to see as you move from a Republican administration to a Democratic administration. But we saw a little bit of a lag in that typical pendulum swing here because of the pandemic. But what we have seen over the course of the last couple of years is OSHA's budget ballooning. Uh, there was a, a windfall of about $100 million that went to OSHA as part of the first COVID relief bill. Uh, and OSHA set about to use that money as well as two budget increases in fiscal year 23 and in fiscal year 24 uh, to, to focus a lot of uh, resources, a lot of attention on staffing up. The agency had dropped to the lowest level of compliance officers in the agency's history at the tail end of the Trump administration, and they have been on a hiring um, binge uh, the last couple of years. They have you know, for a, a workforce at OSHA, a fewer uh, at federal OSHA, a fewer than a thousand employees, they've added 200, more than 200 new compliance officers just in the last year alone. 
that's about 20% of all compliance officers that you might encounter in the field will have been hired in the last year. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Inexperienced compliance officers can be uh, even more difficult uh, for an employer to deal with than more experienced and seasoned compliance officers. But one of the things that you can see as a result of this staffing up is that as OSHA has sort of turned the page beyond the pandemic, they are quickly returning to pre-pandemic levels uh, of inspections and enforcement. And you can see that in fiscal year 22, which was really still a COVID year, I mean, that was like, well, I think it runs through October. So November 2021 through October 2022, uh, a level of inspections was not so different than the pre-pandemic levels. This number you can fully expect will continue to rise over the balance of the uh, Biden administration. So they're back out there in the field. They got a lot of money to play with. They're hiring a lot of employees, and uh, and so we're seeing a lot more of OSHA out in the field. <clears throat> Not only are they doing more inspections. On the next slide, we get into a little bit about what's that what that is translating to in terms of dollars. One of the big things we are seeing, uh, or we have seen, is that the annual penalty increase um, that OSHA uh, has been doing since 2016. Uh, we saw the biggest jumps. Um, that we had seen since the, the since the catch up increase back in 2016, uh, because the annual penalty maximum penalty authority increase rises based on the rate of inflation, based on the increase in the consumer price index over the course of the last year. And as we all know, 2022 and 2023 were the highest levels of infa uh, inflation that we'd seen in this country. Both of those years individually uh, were the two highest years we'd seen in like 40 years. And as a result, we were seeing particularly big increases in OSHA's penalty authority. So now those other than serious and serious Violations cap out at um, more than $15,000 per violation. And uh, willful and uh, repeat violations cap out at over $156,000 per violation. So the, the, the price tag uh, for OSHA citations has gone up. Just as the penalty authority is going up, we are seeing that OSHA's use of those uh, aggravated characterizations, willful and repeat violations, uh, also continue to climb, repeat violations in particular. Uh, you've heard me talk about this, I'm sure, numerous times. Uh, really, really um, a game changer in how OSHA engages in enforcement uh, starting back during the Obama era, where they look back further in time, they look broader in scope rather than looking at a single specific establishment. They will look to any establishment within the same corporate entity uh, in the same general jurisdiction. That means any Fed OSHA state, uh, a violation in any location of the same corporation in, um, in a Fed OSHA state can serve as the basis for a repeat anywhere else in a Fed OSHA state in the country. And, um, and OSHA has become much more proactive. As a result of those three things, we've seen the percentage of OSHA citations characterized as repeat climb like clockwork every single year for the last um, uh, couple of decades. And now, you know, we're, we're up around 6% of citations are characterized as repeat, carrying those 10 times higher penalties, uh, quite a big deal. And how that translates into cumulative penalties on the next slide, you'll see that OSHA, uh, even during a year where we were not quite all the way back to pre-pandemic levels of inspections, OSHA, OSHA blew away the record for um, citation matters or in total enforcement actions with penalties totaling $100,000 or more. Uh, the highest <clears throat> previously had been the first year of the Trump administration, and that was right after that big catch-up um, increase in OSHA's penalty authority. Uh, and then and that was just about $215,000, $100,000 enforcement actions or $100,000 plus enforcement actions. And this last year, there was almost uh, 350 of those. And this is another one where uh, you can be pretty confident this number is going to continue to climb year over year, uh, at least during the balance of the Biden administration. So OSHA, from a data standpoint, there's more of them, more compliance officers doing more inspections, their penalty authority has gone up, and they're using it. So that is the landscape at a general level uh, from enforcement. Uh, and we'll move on, I think, to the next topic of the top 10 this year is going to be some individual and specific enforcement tools 
that OSHA now has um, that they that that I think are potential game changers. And you'll hear me say that a couple of times. And I'm not trying to be uh, hyperbolic, uh, but there there are a couple of things that OSHA has done that are pretty remarkable uh, just within the last few months uh, that will really change the way we practice, change the way that you all need to think about implementing your safety and health program and your compliance obligations with OSHA. And the first one is a big update to the dreaded severe violator enforcement program. So the first slide about this, this sort of reviews the history of this program. What this program is, and I've been borderline obsessed with the severe violator enforcement program uh, for, uh, for the last decade or so. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard me talk about this before. What it is, it is an enforcement program that allows OSHA to target its enforcement resources at those employers that OSHA believes are bad actors and or severe violators, which they define as employers who demonstrate indifference to their OSH Act obligations by committing or really by being alleged to have committed violations in certain categories. And these historically have been the four categories uh, that OSHA looks for uh, to qualify somebody into the severe violator enforcement program. The first is any egregious enforcement action. That is any citation uh, where OSHA has opted to use the per instance citation authority for willful plus some aggravated characterization. And that happens pretty infrequently, uh, but every single one of those egregious cases is a severe violator case. And, uh, and we saw that about 12% of the um, <clears throat> employers who have qualified into SVEP have qualified because of that. Down at the far end, you've got three or more willful repeat or failure to abate violations related to the process safety management standard. This is the standard for petroleum refiners and chemical manufacturers. And you can see how infrequently um, that category was used to qualify employers into the program. The second one is not insignificant one or more willful repeat or failure to abate violations related to a fatality or the hospitalization of, um, uh, actually a hospitalization, fatality or catastrophe. So one or more willful repeat or failure to abate related to a fatality or catastrophe was about 20% of the cases qualifying into SVEP. But the biggest category by far was the high emphasis hazard violations. So employers who are alleged to have committed two or more willful repeat or failure to abate violations related to this very small list right down at the bottom of the slide, that's it. Those were the high emphasis hazards that willful and repeat violations, multiple of them, would qualify you into the severe violator enforcement program. That was almost 70% of cases um, were meeting that criteria, and over 75% of those were being um, qualified in based on repeats, not willfuls, which is a big issue of mine that I think this was targeted, uh, has been targeted poorly. But it's, <clears throat> it's that category that accounts for most of the cases that is the big change that OSHA just announced a few months ago. And on the next slide, we'll see uh, what that change is. Essentially, OSHA left alone the um, fatality and catastrophe and egregious criterion uh, but they eliminated the PSM criterion, not because um, it doesn't matter anymore, but essentially because the PSM criterion was like a standalone high emphasis hazard. And what they've really done is just eliminate that high emphasis hazard limitation to qualifying employers into the severe violator enforcement program. So now, instead of two or more willful and repeats for one of those nine high emphasis hazards or three or more willfuls or repeats, related to PSM, it is now any two or more high gravity willful repeats or failure to abates involving any hazard, any standard, any industry. So this will uh, really blow the doors open uh, to the severe violator enforcement program. And it is expected to, I think probably more than triple the number of employers that qualify into the program on an annual basis. Now, a new element that they've dropped in here is this high gravity modifier. And gravity has existed, uh, and it's always sort of been there in the background, and OSHA uses it to calculate penalties, but it's never been anything that employers really have cared all that much about. Um, uh, you know, we focus on characterization, right? Willful, repeat, serious, other than serious. 
But now gravity is something that is worth looking at and something perhaps worth negotiating about uh, as it affects the uh, severe violator enforcement program. And high gravity means it's high severity and greater probability, which means worst case outcome is death or serious harm. That's high severity. And greater probability is that there is a reasonably high likelihood of an event causing that severe outcome. So two or more high gravity willfuls repeats involving any standard, any hazard, any um, industry is the new um, uh, is the new landmine for employers uh, that will sweep those who you know didn't weren't dealing with citations. They don't have operations that involve falls and trenching and lead and things like that that were the old high emphasis hazards. This program generally was not that scary for you, but now it's any two or more willfuls or repeats. That's going to be um, uh, something that every employer needs to be concerned about now. The next big change that OSHA uh, announced a few months ago was, <clears throat> was a change to the instance by instance citation policy. And this is essentially a change to the egregious enforcement policy, although I, I, it sounds like OSHA is, is not characterizing or calling um, the new instance by instance citations egregious citations like the old ones where it was, well, let's talk about the old ones. So we'll start on the next slide with what is this per instance or instance by instance enforcement generally? Um, dating back to 1990, <clears throat> OSHA issued a directive that, um, uh, that identifies the circumstances when they will issue citations on a violation by violation penalty basis. And what this is essentially is a penalty multiplier. So these will be multiple violations per instance of the same standard. So the classic example is related to PPE. OSHA shows up on a construction site and sees 10 employees not wearing hard hats. The typical way that OSHA would deal with that is to issue one citation of the personal protective equipment standard for the employer's failure to ensure employees wear hard hats. But in certain circumstances, and those circumstances used to be the willful plus standard, uh, OSHA would cite those on a per instance basis. So rather than one hard hat violation, there would be 10 identical hard hat violations, each referencing one of those different 10 employees. And each of those 10 separate citations would carry its own penalty. And they are all willful because it was willful plus was the standard. So you could find yourself with 10 $150,000 hard hat citations, violations of the exact same standard. So it was only done historically with a willful violation plus some aggravating criteria, including willful plus a fatality or catastrophe, willful plus in this current inspection, there were so many violations as to make clear that the employer did not have an effective safety program or willful plus a long history of uh, violations by the same employer. Maybe not so many in this particular inspection, but a long history. And then uh, in general, they could find willful plus conduct as a whole that is clear bad faith. You might find that in instances where employees are lying to the compliance officer, submitting false records, or just conduct that is so outrageous on its face that OSHA decides to go willful plus per instance citations. This was done so extremely rarely on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, and OSHA decided under the leadership of Julie Sue, uh, who is filling in for Marty Walsh, and that is a theme, by the way, as to why things are changing in such a dramatic way. Uh, Julie Sue is the former California Labor Secretary. Doug Parker is the head of OSHA, is the former head of Cal OSHA. We're seeing a little bit of this Californication of Fed OSHA, where super aggressive enforcement policies are rolling out uh, over the last year, or the last several months, and this is one of them. Now, a big change to this on the next slide is instead of that willful plus standard, uh, OSHA has lowered that standard to a high gravity serious standard, and, and even some other than serious violations can be cited on an instance by instance basis. Now, what are the circumstances where they'll do this? First of all, the standard that they're citing has to set an individualized duty rather than a general course of action. 
So you should be looking for standards that say things like provide to each employee training or a respirator or a hard hat uh, or personal protective equipment or um, uh, provide guarding on each pinch point or guard each machine or uh, complete a permit prior to each entry into a confined space. It's that concept of each that makes it clear that that regulation sets an individualized duty and therefore can be cited on an individualized basis based on whatever the unit of measure of that standard is. So if it's each employee for training, if it's each machine for guarding, if it's each entry for um, uh, permit entries under uh, confined space permit entries, that's the unit of measure and OSHA can break that down and cite it on a per instance basis. Contrast that to a general course of duty. Uh, for example, the respirator standard says, evaluate the workplace to identify hazards and make determinations about the need for respirators. That's a general course of action. There's no each in there. It is about a generic general course of action. But once you make that decision, you shall provide to each employee. That's a within that same one standard, there are sub provisions that some are general course of action, some are individualized duties. So provided that the standard allows you to do it, um, OSHA can cite on an instance by instance basis for high gravity serious and some other than serious violations when there is an individualized duty for the moment in these particular high emphasis hazard categories. So falls from heights, machine guarding, lotto, respiratory protection, permit required confined space entry, trenching, and some injury and illness record keeping. So if it's a standard with an individualized duty, it's one of those high emphasis hazards, OSHA can cite serious violations on an instance by instance basis. So 10, $15,000 uh, fall protection violations if they see 10 employees not tied off working from heights. On the next slide, uh, OSHA provides a little bit of um, context for when they are most likely to pursue instance by instance citation. So it meets those criteria we just described, but also there's got to be some motivating factor. And the motivating factors that OSHA has talked about uh, right now are um, uh, fatalities and catastrophe inspections, um, an employer that has received a willful repeat or failure to abate any time in the past five years. Uh, not necessarily this inspection, right? Because this is for serious instance by instance violations. But if you have a willful repeat or failure to abate on your record in the last five years, that will motivate OSHA to look for instance by instance citations in any of the inspections they conduct at your workplace. A good reason, by the way, to fight those dig in, contest them, and get them off your record, because you can see if you've successfully gotten those recharacterized or vacated, at least those characterizations, you are less vulnerable to instance-by-instance instance citations. Um, <clears throat> if OSHA learns that you have failed to report a fatality, a hospitalization, or amputation uh, that you're required to report to OSHA, uh, that will make you more likely to be subject to instance-by-instance instance citations. And that doesn't mean in this particular inspection, that means if they discover that at any time you have failed to report something that was supposed to be reported, then you are vulnerable to instance by instance citations in any inspection that OSHA conducts. So you know, factor that into your analysis about whether you know, it's worth the risk to make a late report um, as opposed to failing to report because late reports don't trigger this motivation for OSHA to go instance by instance. And then OSHA will do injury and illness record keeping violations on an instance by instance basis as well, um, where the underlying injury that you failed to record um, uh, was a high gravity related to a high gravity serious violation itself. So those would typically be other than serious record keeping violations, but they can be cited instance by instance if they involve serious hazards. Okay, so that's instance by instance a big penalty multiplier, a way for OSHA to sharpen its enforcement teeth. Um, and again, I think a, a potential game changer for OSHA enforcement. The last of the uh, top 10 issues that I'm gonna cover today is heat illness. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this from, from two sides. First on the next slide is OSHA's heat illness national emphasis program. Uh, that launched last year 
and we are starting to see those inspections in earnest uh, this year uh, as the temperatures have increased and in fact increased to pretty remarkable record temperatures around the country. <clears throat> uh, this is a national emphasis program that is designed for OSHA um, uh, to basically force the OSHA area offices to at least double the number of heat-related inspections that they conduct. And it is basically prompted by um, high heat conditions. When there are high heat conditions in the area or the jurisdiction where the area offices for OSHA are, uh, are situated, uh, then they are required to go out and conduct a bunch of programmed heat illness national emphasis program inspections in approximately 70 high risk industries. And those are you know, industries that, that involve um, you know, a lot of outdoor work, but also um, you know, some indoor high heat uh, work environments as well. Uh, on the next slide, do we get into the rulemaking? Uh, in the background, even as OSHA is super active in enforcement of um, heat illness issues, they have also uh, been working hard on a heat illness rulemaking. And this gives you a little bit of a history about this rulemaking and where we are now is that you know, OSHA had stood up a couple of committees at NACOSH to help design a heat illness standard for outdoor and indoor, indoor heat illness and to uh, make recommendations to OSHA about the elements that should be included in such a standard. That uh, Those committees have done the work um, <clears throat> uh, compiled their recommendations and submitted those to OSHA. And now that OSHA has those recommendations, they are kicking off the SABRIFA process. And the SABRIFA process is the, um, an opportunity for small business to have their say in this rulemaking. And it is a critical, critical stage in any rulemaking because OSHA, you know, while they don't necessarily listen to employers or industry, all that much during uh, during their rulemaking process, they do listen to small business. And so <clears throat> the, this is the last big, really key opportunity for industry to make sure that its concerns about this potential rule are heard and considered by OSHA. I'm sure many of you have heard or seen uh, that, that, that Kanmasi El Kerry has organized a coalition of employers and trade groups to work on this rule. Uh, that coalition has moved into its next phase, and that phase is the Sabrifa process through the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Um, and even though many of you on this call, I know, are affiliated with very large organizations and could not directly participate in the Sabrifa process, uh, participating with our coalition would allow you to have a say, to have a seat at the table in the Sabrifa process, because our coalition does have a couple of representatives that will be designated as small entity representatives in this process. And as a coalition, we're working together to develop talking points, written comments um, uh, prior to the Sabrifa panel report and after the Sabrifa panel report. So if you are interested in participating in that, um, it is a fee-based coalition, uh, but, but reach out to any of us on this call, let us know if you're interested and we can share some more information about that. I've got a couple of slides about the heat illness rulemaking content. Uh, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail about these. This is essentially the recommendations that came back from the NACOSH work group to OSHA for what they think should be in the rule. We are expecting to see these elements in a proposed rule or as close to a proposed rule as OSHA develops for the Sabrifa process, which we should see very soon. You can see written uh, written program will be needed, a written, a written heat illness prevention plan, substantial training, including for employees and supervisors, environmental monitoring, um, which is, you know, identifying where, you know, whether your workplace uh, is experiencing high heat conditions and taking action when you achieve that. On the next slide, some more elements uh, that the NACOSH committee has recommended. The big one here is the workplace controls, the collection of engineering and administrative controls that will be expected of employers to address heat illness. Our coalition is pushing hard for a, we don't need a standard, but B, if we develop a standard, uh, OSHA, um, uh, it should be a flexible performance-oriented standard, allowing employers lots of discretion in which workplace controls are most appropriate for their workplace and their workforce. 
Um, we are hopeful that's the direction this rule goes, as opposed to a specification type of program that says you shall have these elements in all of your programs, um, um, regardless of your industry, regardless of what part of the country you're in. Uh, we've also got uh, climatization will definitely be a part of this rule that is easing employer employees into working in high heat conditions. And again, we're hopeful for a performance oriented approach as opposed to a, you shall work a reduced work shift for the first day or the first three days and then reduced by this percentage, then reduced by that percentage. We'll just have to see what OSHA puts out and then hopefully we can have some some influence on that through our coalition. I think that is it for me. Uh, I'm going to hand it over now to I think Dan Deacon to talk about the other major rulemaking development, and that's the e-record keeping rule. And I'm going to uh, uh, jump off at this point and join my wife on the rest of our vacation. So thank you everybody for joining us, and uh, and uh, let us know if you have any questions. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. And we're going to jump right into the final amended e record keeping rule, probably the most uh, recent change of, of all the topics that we're talking about here on the, uh, the presentation today. Uh, some news just earlier this week on Monday, right, where the final rule was uh, published, pre published, I should say. It's going to be formally published in Federal Register tomorrow. Uh, but we're going to start really quick with the history of the rule and what changes. Uh, came about this past Monday. So this rule stems from uh, a, a rulemaking back in 2015-2016. It was finalized in May of 2016 under the Obama administration, titled the Improved Tracking of Workplace Injuries and Illnesses. It's what we all collectively know now as the e-record keeping rule. It had two key requirements. Um, one, workplaces with 250 or more workers were required to annually submit their data from all their injury and illness records, right? There are 300 logs, 301 incident reports, and 300 day annual summaries. The second requirement was that workplaces with 20 to 249 workers in high hazard industries in Appendix A to the rule were only required to submit 300 A data. So that first requirement never actually went into effect. The injury tracking application hadn't been rolled out to accept those uh, 301 incident reports and the 300 logs. Um, so we never actually had that piece of the rule implemented at all. It was formally rescinded in January 2019 under the Trump administration. Um, and just a couple other points on kind of the history and the intent of the rule. Obviously, we all know that the data is being used now for uh, targeted enforcement, right? They use this data to generate the SST program and the lists of employers that they target to inspect based on all the data that you submit through this e-record keeping rule. And um, under the uh, original rule in 2016, it was intended to be published. Um, all the data that was collected was going to be published for the public to see on OSHA's website that was rolled out shortly uh, thereafter. Um, and it is all available now. Um, every year's uh, data that was submitted is on OSHA's website um, for, for anyone and everyone to see. So moving on to the next slide, um, we have a new proposal, right? And this came about in March of 2022 under the Biden administration. And remember, uh, President Biden was the vice president back under the uh, Obama administration. So we see somewhat of a return to the original intent of the rule after the, the soft kind of, really there was no changes uh, under the Trump administration. Um, so March 2022, OSHA issued the proposed rule seeking to significantly expand the e-record keeping requirements even beyond what Obama's OSHA uh, had promulgated back in 2016. And those key proposed changes are what you see on the screen here. Uh, it was going to maintain that requirement for establishments with 20 or more employees in high hazard industries to submit the 300A data. Um, and it, it restructured the list of covered industries in existing Appendix A. Uh, the second piece, it eliminated that, or it proposed to eliminate the current requirement for all workplaces with 250 or more employees to submit 300A data. And it was going to replace that requirement with a new requirement that those workplaces with 100 or more employees in a new set of high hazard industries, it's a new proposed Appendix B, they're going to be required to submit all of their injury and illness record keeping uh, data. So the 300 logs, 301 incident reports, 
and the 300 day data. And what we got just this past Monday is the final rule that was pre-published um, and issued in a press release. Uh, it's going to be published in the Federal Register tomorrow, and the rule goes into effect on January 1st, 2024. So it's going to be that next data submission uh, by March 2nd of 2024. Uh, you're going to be required to submit uh, data under these new uh, requirements. And what are they? So the same uh, requirement under the original rule that establishments with 20 or more employees in high hazard industries, those listed in that new modified Appendix A, they still need to submit their 300A data. And then establishments with 100 or more employees in that new Appendix B, uh, they're required to submit the 300A data, Form 300 log, and the Form 301 incident report information once a year, uh, of course, by March 2nd. And the most surprising piece to all of this um, was OSHA's decision to maintain that requirement for establishments with 250 or more employees, not in designated high hazard industries to continue submitting their 300A data. Um, so if you remember just a, a slide or two ago that the initial proposal back in March, 2022 was gonna be to eliminate that requirement altogether. OSHA decided, nope, we're gonna continue with that requirement. Um, it aligns with the intent of the standard to collect as much data as possible and use it for targeted enforcement purposes. And we've already been doing it uh, for six plus years, right? So really it was a proposal and the new final rule that's gonna be published tomorrow is kind of worse than what, what we thought and what was originally proposed. And on the next two slides, we're just, uh, this is for informational purposes. We published uh, or Put on the slides here those new covered um, or the, the restructured appendix a for for those uh, establishments with 20 or more um, employees in high hazard industries and then on the next slide is appendix b that new appendix b for those specific uh, targeted high hazard industries with 100 or more employees that are going to be required to submit all of their injury and illness records 300 log 301 incident report and 300a data so moving on to the next topic, number six here is uh, OSHA's union walk around inspection rights rulemaking. Um, and this really has a long history to it. We're talking about 2013. Um, back in February, 2013, uh, OSHA uh, responded uh, to a request from uh, a union um, for an interpretation of 29 CFR 1903.8. Uh, and this really is uh, about representatives and who can participate uh, or employer, or, I'm sorry, employee representatives and who can participate in an OSHA inspection. And the question that was posed was, may workers at a work site without a collective bargaining agreement designate a person affiliated with a union or community organization to act on their behalf as a walk around representative? So the relevant regulation, 1903.8C, says that representatives authorized by the employees uh, can participate, um, even if they're a third party who is not an employee of the employer, um, if the co show and uh, good cause has been shown uh, that it's reasonably necessary for those third party individuals to conduct an effective and, and thorough physical inspection of the workplace. And the intent here was really those with specialty knowledge, right? An industrial hygienist or a safety engineer that's really going to help with the inspection. Um, Nonetheless, OSHA responded in the affirmative and said that, yes, uh, union representatives uh, can be reasonably necessary when they'll make a positive contribution to the inspection. Um, and this really generated a lot of backlash from the regulated community, and there was challenges to that. Um, as you'll see on the next slide, um, industry did challenge the interpretation, asserting that it was so inconsistent with the regulation that it effectively rewrote it, right, without APA notice and, and comment rulemaking. Um, so April 2017 comes around and the Trump administration formally rescinds that, that 2013 letter and it was archived. Fast forward uh, about six years later, and we have the Biden administration initiating a new rulemaking uh, titled the Worker Walkaround Representative Designation Process, seeking to formally amend 
C. And basically what this is intended to do is adopt that 2013 ocean interpretation letter that caused so many problems in the backlash uh, initially. So the quote that you see on the screen here is directly from in that rulemaking. This rulemaking will clarify the rights of workers and certified bargaining units to specify a union representative to accompany OSHA during the inspection facility walk around, regardless of whether the representative is an employee of the employer, if in the judgment of the COSHO, it's reasonably necessary uh, for an effective and thorough physical inspection. So this rulemaking is underway and its target completion is this year. We're keeping a close eye on that, but really the, the big change here is obviously going back to uh, that, that 2013 interpretation letter formally allowing uh, union representatives to participate in OSHA inspections at non-union workplaces. So this is something to keep an eye on and, and closely follow as this rulemaking progresses. And we'll certainly be uh, talking about that on our blog. And uh, uh, I'm sure once this rule comes out, uh, we'll have more details for you as well. The next uh, update is uh, OSHA's new Fall Hazard National Emphasis Program. And um, this really stems from uh, an NEP that was issued back in May of 2023, uh, the launch of the new enforcement NEP. It's focused solely on fall hazards, and it applies to all industries. Um, so currently, there's a 90-day outreach period. Um, so these programmed inspections aren't scheduled to begin until July 30th, so 10, 10 days. We have 10 days to go. Um, but really, the, the overall intent of this was uh, to address kind of a significant hazard in the workplace that they've collected based on data, right? Uh, the enforcement history that OSHA has shows that falls remain the leading cause of serious injuries and fatalities in all industries. And if you see some of the data on here, nearly 31% of all inspections uh, conducted between 2014 and 2021 had a fall emphasis. So that's a significant number of inspections where this topic is, is really an emphasis and a priority. Um, so just a couple other things to, to note. By June 30th, 2023, the state plans were required to submit a notice of intent to adopt that fall NEP. Um, it doesn't have an expiration date, um, but OSHA is going to review its effectiveness uh, within six months to determine whether it's uh, going to continue with that national emphasis program or, or amend it in some format, in some way. So a couple other things to note uh, in particular about this NEP on the next slide is really as you'll you're probably all familiar with OSHA's other enforcement initiatives or, or slightly familiar and, and their other emphasis programs where uh, those programs are, are designed to generally, you know, target lists of employers to inspect uh, based on their NAICS code. A, a list is generated and area offices use those lists to go out and target specific employers. Um, but under this NEP, uh, inspectors are, are basically authorized to perform an NEP inspection um, anytime they observe someone working at heights. So this can be, you know, someone driving home uh, from their workday and they notice someone on the roof without fall protection on the way to an inspection. Um, it's really kind of plain view, right? If they see something in the workplace where someone's not utilizing fall protection or they believe that it's a fall protection hazard, a fall hazard, um, they can initiate an inspection under this fall protection NEP or fall hazard NEP. Um, so in unrelated programs or, or unprogrammed inspections, OSHA is gonna be observing the work area for potential fall hazards and that can give them the authority to expand the inspection. So even if they're at your workplace for another reason, say it's to uh, inspect a complaint that has nothing to do with fall protection, if they observe something in the work area uh, while they're there for, for that complaint inspection, and it's related to, uh, or what they observe is related to potential fall hazards, uh, the inspection can be expanded under this fall NEP. So it's really limited um, to evaluating exposure to, to potential fall hazards. Um, so that's going to be the scope of the inspection under the NEP. But of course, OSHA can always expand the scope of that inspection further if there's evidence of other potential hazards from injury and illness records, uh, if they see something in plain view, plain sight, right? 
or uh, a potential hazard um, uh, comes up in em employee interviews. Um, so it's something to, to keep in mind if OSHA does come on site, be aware of uh, the potential for them to expand um, and, and look at these fall protection and fall hazard issues uh, in your workplace. So with that, I think I'm turning it over to Rachel and she's going to cover uh, the Cal OSHA update. Thanks, Dan. Um, I know that Cal OSHA may not affect everyone on this call, but given that it is the most uh, aggressive state plan and the largest, we certainly wanted to hit um, a couple highlights that are happening out here out west uh, right now. Uh, so we will start off with heat illness. So as many of you know that have employees in California or have facilities out here, outdoor heat illness uh, standard is nothing new. Uh, there's the existing standard under 8 CCR 3395 applying to all outdoor places of employment. Where uh, the new regulations are coming is in the indoor heat, um, heat illness arena. And currently it is uh, regulated under the IIPP standard, but we've been uh, part of the rulemaking process for the indoor heat uh, standard for quite a while now. Uh, it would apply to any indoor workplace when the temperature reaches 82 degrees and, um, and then additional heightened requirements for over 87. There was a public hearing on the indoor heat illness draft standard back in May, uh, the Cal OSHA got over 400 comments. And so my understanding is that they're still going through those. We may or may not see an additional revision to the draft standard. Um, however, for the standards board to uh, get this in place by summer of 2024, they would have to vote on it at the first quarter of uh, 2024. So they're certainly running out of time to get that in place if that's something that they want um, for 2024, for summer of 2024. And one trend that we are seeing in California, and we'll talk about in a minute, is that Cal OSHA has been running up against the Cal California legislature. So the more time that Cal OSHA takes to get these standards in place, uh, that has opened up the legislature to put in place its own statute. So one of the things that is interesting here is that if Cal OSHA doesn't get the indoor heat illness rulemaking process wrapped up soon, will the legislature uh, step in and put in place their own statute? So there is a standards board meeting today uh, that uh, members of the CMC California team are attending. So if we have some updates on where we are with the indoor heat illness rulemaking process, we will certainly uh, put that up on the Cal OSHA blog for you. One other thing to keep in mind about heat illness in California right now, and I know a lot of employers are dealing with this, but there is a current Cal OSHA special emphasis program. It affects both outdoor and indoor heat related complaints. And essentially any complaint that is heat related, Cal OSHA must address it on an on-site inspection. So that certainly has opened up the amount of inspections that we've been seeing, um, as well as the citations that are being issued. So keep that in mind um, that you may be getting some additional visits from Cal OSHA uh, as the summer progresses. And this is certainly an area that we've been seeing additional citations uh, in. So next we're just gonna do a quick COVID update. As I'm sure many of you know that have uh, California-based facilities, the non-emergency standard went into effect uh, earlier this year in February, and it's gonna continue to be in effect for the next two years. But one of the updates that we wanted to make sure that you're aware of is that last month, the California Department of Public Health redefined what an outbreak is via one of their orders. And this just applies to 
uh, non-healthcare facilities. So there's a different definition of outbreak for healthcare facilities, but for non-healthcare, they have now defined outbreak as at least three COVID cases during a seven day period. So that is um, part of the outbreak section of the current COVID-19 standard. And that's down from 14 days. So for those of you that have been struggling with defining who's in an exposed group, this should significantly narrow the amount of outbreaks that uh, you will have, um, given that we're only looking at the three day, three cases in seven days. Um, that doesn't change how long it takes for you to get out of the outbreak, um, but it does hopefully limit the amount of outbreaks that you have. And then one reminder of an upcoming change that the notification requirements for the on-site COVID cases where you have to make that notification within one business day will be sunsetting at the um, beginning of 2024. That's been an onerous one for employers, although it's now, you can now post that, um, but that is a reminder that that will be sunsetting um, coming up very soon. And now we're gonna move over to what's going on with workplace violence. And for me, this is the biggest one for employers in California to keep an eye on, uh, to track. It's gonna probably have the most impact um, going forward. So if there's one thing for you guys to, to pay attention to, it's gonna be this one. Uh, California for many years has already had a workplace violence prevention standard for healthcare. And it's a pretty onerous standard. Um, Healthcare facilities have struggled to get this uh, in place and operational. It, if you've ever um, litigated one of these, you just know they're just a bear to deal with. Uh, and as more incidents of workplace violence have arisen, there was a petition to start a workplace violence prevention in all industries. Uh, standard and rulemaking process. And that's been uh, going on since at least 2017, when I believe we had the first draft and the last latest draft of it was out last year. And employers have been very vocal uh, with regards to the last draft. And there was a lot of good amendments made, revisions made that were uh, getting it in a place that it was a lot more operational for general industry. However, earlier this year, uh, the California legislature decided that Cal OSHA was taking a little too long to get that standard out and that it wasn't as protective as the healthcare standard. So they introduced a bill that is based on the healthcare standard, uh, which again is much more onerous than the general industry standard that is uh, currently out on draft. And this new standard that we're seeing going through the legislature, uh, it does three things. Um, it would amend the workplace violence uh, restraining order uh, provision of the civil code, and it would allow uh, unions or collective bargaining agents to be able to get a workplace violence restraining order on behalf of an employee. And the other things that it does is that it amends the IIPP standard to include as an element having a workplace violence prevention plan. And then of course adds to the labor code what must be in that plan. And this is all based on healthcare. So again, we're talking about things that don't actually apply really into the general industry. Um, you're gonna see things also added to it that include what employers can't do with regards to confronting, for instance, shoplifters. So it's much more prescriptive than what we were seeing in um, the general industry draft standard from Calosha. There's also no exemption for small employers. So currently, uh, Calosha has not stated when they're going to release the next draft of the workplace violence prevention uh, 
plan that they've been working on, I believe that part of that is that they're waiting to see what goes on with this bill and if it passes. Uh, California legislature is on break right now. They're going to be back next month and they have till the 14th to pass the bill. So we will see um, if it gets through and the governor has um, until October 14th to either sign or veto it. So we will certainly keep you updated on this bill, um, but it is the one to watch. And with that, I will uh, give it to Darius. Hi everyone, this is Darius. Um, so I'm gonna try and cover these uh, last few topics, which are similarly interesting, but very, very different. Um, so I'll start off with last week, this um, new warehouse um, national assist program that was announced, yeah, as I said, just last week. Um, it was, it's a new enforcement national assist program. It's really focused on, on kind of two main arenas with a separate, you know, high injury rate retailer. So first it's focused on these warehousing and distribution centers. Um, and what motivated it was in the last sort of 11 years, there's been this real, really significant growth in the number of employees who are working in warehouses and distribution centers. Uh, it was pretty striking. Basically, in the last 11 years, the number of employees working in these establishments has tripled to about 2 million employees. And similarly, with that sort of increase in the number of employees working there, there's also been an increase in the rate of injury. Um, so the, the idea behind this national office program is it's really intended to target the hazards that OSHA believes are causing this increase in the rate of injuries and illnesses. So under this NEP, there's sort of two types of inspections that are available sort of to these um, two groups. First, for sort of the warehouses and distribution centers, um, under this national emphasis program, they're sort of going to be looking to uh, looking out for these comprehensive safety inspections, meaning that the inspectors can inspect them from wall to wall. Um, whereas the high injury rate retailers are going to be subject to these partial scope inspections, which are really limited to the storage and loading areas. I think the dead even they're more sort of similar to the warehousing, warehouses and distribution centers. However, for the partial scope inspections for the high injury rate retailers, um, they can, these inspections can be expanded to more than just the storage and loading areas. And there's sort of three ways that would likely happen. One, if an employee were to sort of indicate a hazard to the inspector, two, if the inspector were to see something in plain view that was occurring, that was a hazard that they wanted to um, look into, or three, it's for the OSHA 300 logs, identified some sort of hazard um, outside of the storage and loading areas. But for, for both types of um, inspection for the two types of um, establishments, there's sort of four types of hazards that inspectors are looking into. Um, one, it's these powered industrial trucks and other sort of material handling and storage operation um, to sort of your, your walking, working kind of hazards, slips, trips, and falls. Three, your means of egress, kind of blocked aisles. Um, and as well as that, heat, illness, and ergonomics are also sort of subject to be evaluated by inspectors while they're conducting the inspections. Um, in terms of which employers are covered, it's pretty broad. I think it's really going to cover... Um, a really, really wide variety of, of sort of anyone who has a warehouse. Um, so you've got on the left, there are these warehouses and distribution centers. And we can see that they're like very, very broad. And again, um, the warehouse and distribution centers, they're the sort of establishments that are going to be looking for these full wall-to-wall -wall inspections. Whereas on the right, the high injury rate retailers, you know, your home centers, your home depots, et cetera, um, those are going to be more partial scope inspections. But again, they're subject to be expanded um, you know, depending on how the inspection actually goes. Now, in terms of sort of the state OSH plans, because this is such a priority to OSHA, they're required to participate. However, the caveat is that they have two months to decide whether they want to take one of two options. First, they can either, they can choose to adopt the National Emphasis Program as is, or alternatively, they also have the option of um, adopting a plan that is sort of at least as effective as this plan. So they could um, adopt this plan and go further. I think typically the, the state plans tend to adopt the national emphasis program. However, we'll keep an eye out and sort of inform everyone if we see anything that is sort of distinct from that or any state plans going noticeably further. But they have about two months to sort of signal to that OSHA what their intention is and whether they want to kind of um, you know stick with the emphasis plan as is or as I mentioned go further. The um, and the emphasis program it's sort of it's scheduled to terminate three years um, from its implementation date last Thursday. 
at that three years, it can, um, OSHA has the ability to obviously renew it and continue it, which I think is likely. However, um, there's also an option within, you know, during the uh, tenure of the MSF program, the OSHA, that OSHA can reevaluate and decide if it's not sort of hitting the targets at once in terms of the number of hazards, the number of employees, you can sort of um, revise the MSF program. And, and that's written in the directive as well. And then lastly, um, but very, very distinctly, there's sort of an MC or well, a whistleblower protection program that OSHA announced in February of this year. Um, this is a pretty interesting program, really, really distinct from anything else we've discussed today. And the goal of this is basically back in, I think, like 2000, um, Congress uh, enacted this piece of legislation called the Victims of Tracking, Trafficking and Violence Protection Act. And the premise of this is that it wanted to create visas for individuals who were sub like subject who were victims of crime, um, but their immigration status dissuaded them from sort of reporting these crimes. So the two main categories of that are one, individuals who don't have legal status, or two, individuals whose um, legal status depends on their employers. So obviously, for those those sort of individuals, they're um, very very likely to be dissuaded from reporting crimes as it could affect their um, immigration status and cause them you know, to potentially be deported. So in very, very specific circumstances, and, and what that piece of legislation did is it created sort of two types of visas, U visas and T visas. The U visas are sort of for victims of a wide variety of crimes, um, but like very, very serious crimes, you're talking about murder, assault, kidnapping, um, yeah, stalking, felonious assault, domestic violence, extortion, false imprisonment, and then the T visas are really like limited to traffic. And as part of those visas, what has to happen is any individual who wants to apply for them needs to have sort of law enforcement to fill, um, fill out a sort of certification indicating that the victim is sort of assisting in the investigation or alternatively for T visas is unable to do so. Um, now what's happened is as of February, OSHA isn't able to sort of give the visas themselves, but they are now able to support the visas by filling out these sort of certifications. Um, but again, only in these limited circumstances that are sort of on the slide here, right? So if there's an individual who is a victim of a qualifying criminal activity or a victim of trafficking, it's occurring in their work environment and or employment relationship, and it's related to a violation of law um, that OSHA enforces. So it's this really, really limited fact pattern. Um, and it'll be really sort of intriguing to find out how OSHA uses this um, because it's such a sort of select, you know, these are very specific elements that would be sort of um, and it feels like a small subset of cases would really have fulfilled. It'll be interesting. One thing I've heard is that this um, this helps through some instances where individuals might not have in individuals in rural places where they might not have access to you know a lot of law enforcement presence to help them usually get that certification for the visa. Now it's just, it's just added to that network of people who can assist um, sort of victims of crime and you know trafficking. So to see how this works, I think it's, it's a pretty important initiative that you know certainly could help individuals who are in you know pretty dire circumstances if you're hitting all these elements and hopefully enable them to sort of extricate them from a, you know what could only be a really terrible situation. So it's an interesting program. It'll be interesting to see how OSHA uses it, and it'll be also interesting to see the extent that we find out about how it's used because I would imagine um, you know certainly a lot of these sort of instances are going to be mostly confidential. Um, then there's a quick update on those two instances, um, but we can go towards the end and if anyone has any questions, um, this is sort of the webinar series for the rest of the year. So we've got um, a few interesting ones coming up, the, the, the state plan update coming up next. And then as well as that, um, this is the MSHA webinar series. These are our blogs that are, that are really interesting. And, and really, I think for everything we discussed on today, um, have a lot more expanded um, blogs on exactly what we've discussed. And with that, um, I guess we've, we've sort of run out of time, but, but thanks everyone for listening. Um, we'll try and go through the questions in the chat and get back to everyone. Um, but I hope you all have a good one and it was a great giving everyone an update on issue today.